We have to do it separately. It's starting. It is now recording and is live. All right. Wow. I didn't know you had to do it separately. All right. Good job, right. everyone. Go ahead, Joshua. Well, uh, this is the June Tech Lancaster uh, virtual streaming meetup. We're trying a different format than the normal YouTube. See if we like the more interactive form later. Uh, the plan is to upload it to YouTube later. So keep that in mind in making any comments. Um, and, uh, I don't actually have the announcements that I sent Chad in earlier because on YouTube, it doesn't make sense for me to try to do the announcements separately from the speaker. So if you could just run through your announcement that I sent you, that would be handy, Chad, and I'll turn it over to you for the rest of it. Sounds good. All right. So those June announcements are, uh, calling out the techlancaster.com community calendar. That's techlancaster.com. I will post that in the chat now. Here we go. Cool. Um, so there are still things happening. Uh, and Lancaster is actually start. I don't know if things in person are happening yet since everything that would be on this calendar is uh, sort of like in-person optional. But, yeah, yeah, you kind of have to check each person, each event, because uh, I'm not sure that uh, routine meetings took themselves off yet it, that haven't been meeting in the last eight weeks. And uh, I don't know that everybody has fully updated with what their online plans are for the ones who do have online plans. So that's a little cool. unfortunate, but at least late, you know what groups are potentially out there and hopefully will be again in a, another month or two. Right. Uh, second thing to call out is um, join the Lancaster Tech Community Slack at amishtech.slack.com. The Amish, one of the last uh, cultural and religious minorities that it's cool to, uh, I don't know, use. Um, <laughs> Lancaster, uh, what is LUG? Uh, Linux, Linux user, user group. group. Cool. So if you're if you're into Linux, check out the uh, Linux users group, meetup.com, Lank, L-U-G. Um, and the Lancaster Artificial Intelligence Meetup at LancasterAI.com. That's here. And finally, next month's Tech Lancaster Meetup, that's where you are now, that's what you're watching, um, will also be virtual. So we're still not going to be coming back to in-person. All right. Uh, with that, unless there's anything else that someone who's in the, like, who's here in person has something to say. Uh, if not, I'm going to go ahead and kick off my talk. Cool. All right. I will present now my entire screen. Oh, and let me share the link to this. Anyone on the internet with this link can view. So these are my slides. Oh, and uh, just before Chad starts, if you have questions and you don't want to interrupt Chad, um, I'm in the chat. I'm part of Near too. I'm actually not in Lancaster, though. I'm in California. Uh, <laughs> I can uh, answer questions for you guys if you have like technical or otherwise questions that can't wait till the end. In cool. Uh, so yeah, that's. I was just going about to introduce uh, Nir and Peter, um, but yes, this talk is called Thinking in Blockchain. What kinds of new apps do blockchains make possible? Um, I'm Chad Ostrowski. I live here in Lancaster. I join you from my balcony today. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Chado. Uh, you can follow Nir at Nir Protocol or find out more at nir.org. Um, Near is a like next generation blockchain. We'll get into what that means, but the point of this talk is for people who don't know, like, you know, blockchain goes through hype cycles represented by its price. Um, so here in 2013, uh, the economy of Greece melted down and there was a big spike. Doesn't look very big anymore because the spike in late 2017, early 2018 just dwarfs it. Every new spike dwarfs the old spikes in general. Um, and when you're here in crypto winter, that's when like the annoying people who smell money go away and real work happens. 
Um, so you might be aware of like blockchains because of the hype cycles, um, but you might agree with this XKCD, um, which is xkcd.com, a webcomic, if you're not familiar, but I love this. I, I love things that make fun of blockchain. Um, I am a true believer that blockchains will be very useful and will be used by a wide variety of applications in the future. Um, but I, I think that the hype cycles when the, when the money goes up misrepresent, like it, people get all sorts of silly ideas about what they're good for. Um, and I think in 2017, both Peter and I um, were telling a lot of people that they didn't actually need a blockchain for what they were doing. So a lot of, a lot of ideas that people think whenever, whenever this starts happening and like people get excited everyone starts thinking that they have a blockchain idea. Um, so the goal of this talk is to help you think about what actually might make sense to put on a blockchain, what they're actually good for, um, and to take what might be kind of in the unknown, unknown category right now and move it into the known, unknown category. So you know what to go look up when you think like, I think a blockchain might be useful for this particular thing. Um, that's the goal here. Any questions before we move on? Great. Well, with that, uh, what is blockchain? We're just going to spend a couple minutes kind of defining this. So I, I just want to ask this question. What are ledgers? And this is an audience question. So tell me, not, not like, what is a ledger? Because I think we all know kind of like we have an idea of a ledger keeps track of things, but what kinds of things are kept track of in ledgers? What are some ledgers that you may have uh, used or interacted with, or what kinds of ledgers might events of your life be kept track of? Like, what are ledgers keeping track of in your life right now? So audience, go. Well, I'm a James Malone here. I'm a treasurer for a bunch of nonprofits, so. <laughs> I have ledgers everywhere. Literal ledgers <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> ledgers every exactly. Yeah. So treasurer stuff for sure, right? Like how much money came in, how much money is going out. Uh, that's bank accounts and transactions and, and company uh, like expenditure, all that kind of stuff. Do you have other, do you want to give more color to that? Or like, did I, did I, throw out. No, I mean, that really is the, well. that really is the basics of it. I mean, you have your GLs and your buckets and, you know, moving your, your ledgers, just not just tracking the money in the account, but you know, what bucket has it been designated to and all those in and outs uh, between things. So, um, yeah. You know, yeah. Perfect example. Other, can other people think of examples? If it's not obvious, we all like have interacted with ledgers all over the place. Um, I can start I'll, throwing some out. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a, a very non-obvious one out, which is marriage certificates, right? So uh, when you get married, you actually go to the public record and your name goes down on a ledger and the document itself is a ledger of your marriage. So that's a non-obvious one. And in that vein, birth certificates, death certificates, all those big life events are entered on some official ledger somewhere. Any other ones it. people can think yeah. of? Yeah. If people are saying things in the chat, just so you're aware, I'm not going to check that for the duration of the talk. So Peter, I'm counting on you to, oh, I didn't introduce you. Peter also works at Near, as he already said, and is gonna be uh, kind of like playing, playing the wingman role during this talk and filling in gaps when I forget to mention things. All right, well, since you're all being shy, other ones that Peter and I were uh, talking about before this talk, passports, deeds, escrow accounts, car registrations, receipts, ledgers are everywhere. So like these are, these are, and they're usually 
some official like government office is in charge of keeping track of all of these ledgers. Um, so that's that's how we kind of do ledgers in in the world right now. Uh, what blockchain gives you is decentralized ledgers. Um, so rather than like one person, one office, one company being in charge of like making sure that the ledger is accurate, um, strong cryptographic mathematical guarantees, make sure that the ledger is accurate and a bunch of different people around the world have copies of it and make sure that when people, other people want to add new stuff to it, that that stuff gets added in a um, predictable way, basically. Um, I don't have another slide on this. There are a bunch of great explainer videos. Uh, I will I will make sure that I add my favorite to the uh, like the description below the talk on YouTube. And um, there's a final slide that it's not on yet, but I'll add it. I just thought of it. Um, but if you want to learn more about like the guts of how blockchains work, that's not what this talk is for. So, um, but that's I, I think. That's the best starting point, I think, is like blockchains are decentralized ledgers. So we'll get more into like what that's useful for. That's the purpose of this talk. So blockchain history, 2009, Bitcoin was created and it was sort of a distributed ledger proof of concept. And the most obvious thing, the first thing that came up for what's a ledger good for is money, sending payments, cryptocurrency, right? Like Bitcoin was great at that, is great at that. It's still a, the way a lot of people come into this whole blockchain ecosystem is through Bitcoin. Um, it's not great though, if you want to use it as a, actually I'll, I'll go into Ethereum. The kind of, the people who created Ethereum realized that like rather than only record transactions who sent money to who, you can embed like logic in these and the people who are doing that work of uh, keeping track of the state of the system and like what new requests are coming in instead of just recording a simple history of like this person sends money to this person, they can run a little virtual machine on their computer or on their server that's doing this. Um, and it can run a whole programming language. So Ethereum uses the programming language Solidity um, and it is a general purpose programming language. You can do a whole bunch of stuff with Ethereum. And we'll get into what kinds of things people are doing with Ethereum today. Um, 2020, uh, Nier and others. And I'm only going to mention Nier because, of course, I am. Um, it's like even more general computing platform. And I say that um, half in jest, but I think that it's... Uh, like you can, there are significant limitations to Ethereum. Uh, it's not very scalable, only like 14 transactions per second can happen in the entire Ethereum network. Um, to For comparison for like, since blockchains kind of have their origins in money, I think it's useful to compare it to Visa is doing like 1700, 1700 transactions per second um, globally, like, on average. Um, so like way more, 14 transactions per second is not a great way to have like a, a worldwide general purpose, uh, like computer or computing platform. Um, so Near and some other newfangled blockchains are designed to be much more scalable. Um, and Near is also designed to be much more developer friendly. So instead of Solidity, you can use any language that compiles to Wasm um, with particularly strong support right now for Rust and AssemblyScript, which is a dialect of TypeScript, which is like basically JavaScript with types. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of like that to me is the baseline of like blockchain history that I think is useful. Um, I would also lump, Ethereum is making a new version called Ethereum 2.0, and I would lump Ethereum 2.0 in with these other ones. Like, it gets around the limitations of kind of how that underlying protocol works, moving from proof of work to proof of stake. Um, and, and that makes all the transactions much more inexpensive. Uh, it makes it use much less energy. It makes it a lot faster. Um, and then, 
like different way, all these different blockchains have different ways to scale the network as more people start joining. Okay, so what's Ethereum good for? Um, rewards programs, this is maybe the smallest area, um, but I, I, you may have seen some news recently that uh, Reddit is now awarding instead of just Reddit Karma, they're experimenting. I think they just call it community reward, community awards or rewards. Peter, can you fill in? I don't remember, but a community coin, something you can earn from. I think it's community rewards. Yeah, and it's like a specific subreddit has its own token, its own currency, if you will, um, and you are awarded by Reddit this currency, and that currency is is backed by the Ethereum network. They're planning to build this on Ethereum. Um, funny, and... funny. It's it's two specific subreddits they're piloting. One is cryptocurrency, which makes sense to me. The other one is Fortnite. I don't know why they chose that one as their second one. But it's more popular in Fortnite than in the cryptocurrency subreddit. So, I guess they chose well. Um, like more people are going after those awards already. So instead of just getting Reddit Karma, which is like valid on Reddit because Reddit says so, but is not valid elsewhere, you'll have this, uh, you'll be able to verify that you own an actual asset that's backed by the blockchain. Um, and it could potentially be, it will be tradable elsewhere, right? Like you'll be able to sell, you'll, someone at some point will list one of these tokens on like an actual exchange and you'll be able to swap like ether Ethereum's native currency for like the cryptocurrency subreddit token or the Fortnite subreddit token. Um, so that's that's one cool thing, kind of this portability, this verifiability, it unties it from Reddit, the company. So those are some reasons that you might want to run a rewards program on a blockchain instead of specifically, like instead of having it owned by your your website, your company. One, one quick Any questions other, on that? Oh yeah, go, please. One, one, one other benefit of running a rewards program, like in this specific case is, uh, there's this buzzword in blockchain called permissionless. I think this is a good example of what a permissionless system looks like is, I don't need to go and ask Reddit if I can transfer my, my coin by the design of the system. But also in the future, if Reddit decides to stop supporting it, there's a contract that's maintaining this rather than a server. So maybe Reddit can like, turn the contract off or stop adding funds to it. But if everyone in the community decides it's valuable, they can transfer real money to that contract to keep it alive, right? Or copy it and like have it at a different address that it could be completely community run, which is what the idea of like not needing permission actually looks like in the real world. Yes, and one other thing that I want to call out because you used a word that I hadn't actually introduced yet, I don't think, is this idea of contracts. Um, so Ethereum uh, calls, like you deploy a smart contract to the Ethereum network. And that means that all of these, all of these computers, all the nodes in the network that uh, like are going to run that computation and keep track of what's happening in the system, you, you're deploying that smart contract to all of them right now. Um, and then I think it's like the specific miner. So one specific computer is going to run your computation. Is that accurate, Peter, or do they all have to run it? Yeah, is that so, the so one has to run it um, and then you have everybody verify it. That's like proof of work. So like everybody in the entire network is gonna verify the like legitimacy of your transactions. But like, yeah, they, they have ways of, I mean, long story short, I guess you could say that everybody has to run it at some point because in order to verify it, you actually run it. So. Yeah, yeah. So, but that that program that you're deploying to the blockchain is called a smart contract. Um, people mm -hmm. in actual contract law hate that term because they think that these have nothing to do with actual contracts. And they think that regular contracts are pretty smart. Thank you very much. I don't know if that's true, but I imagine that's what they would say. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think we're basically stuck with that term at this point five years in so that's that's what like all blockchains now call these programs that you deploy to a blockchain are smart contracts um so when peter was saying that like rewards program the reddit rewards program is backed by this contract 
it's this actual piece of code that's operating on the entire Ethereum network, which has more broad support in theory than uh, it certainly has. Actually, how much is Reddit worth? Do we know? I was going to say that like Ethereum has more support than Reddit. I don't know no. if that's true in terms of like stakeholders and who cares about it, but. Yeah, Ethereum is like hundreds of billions. Reddit might, might be like tens of billions, but I'm not, I'm not really sure. It's an interesting question. And it's only one way to measure value, obviously. Like I think more people would be sad if, uh, if Reddit suddenly disappeared than if Ethereum suddenly disappeared. Right Technically, now, it's most recent fundraise. Reddit was valued at three billion dollars, and, and uh, market cap of Ethereum. I'm looking that up now. I can't find it. Um, well, I'll, and of I'll, course, I'll, the I'll, obvious, the obvious question though is, what's its real value? You know, two dollars, three dollars. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, the like there's a, we'll get into this, but there's a lot of money that is like locked up in Ethereum smart contracts. So I, I'm like, there's people move a lot of money around with Ethereum. It's useful for that. Um, and you could even say that with like Bitcoin, right? Like there's the baseline to me, it sounds like you're kind of uh, hinting at this critique of, of blockchains that like, they're not really worth anything. Um, but at the oh no no line, I was talking about the I'm sorry I was talking about the actual value of like uh, Reddit, Tumblr, <laughs> you know <laughs> the media communications. I apologize, but no gotcha. that that actually is a good point to bring up though is the um, you know the distribution of real value across um, exactly the cryptocurrency. Yeah. Yeah. To me, that's always been like, at the very least, what you can say is the like value proposition of a blockchain is that it allows you to move like uh, uh, an asset around globally without like without these intermediaries, right? Without the like legacy banking system, if you will. Um, and that is valuable. That's useful. So yeah, I think at a minimum, that's what blockchains, at least Bitcoin um, is or, or are useful for. So anyway, I don't know that I would say Reddit is actually worth $3. Um, I think a lot of like culture and uh, meaning happens for people there from what I understand, though I am not a user of it. Um, but anyway, I think Ethereum, like lots of people would be sad if Ethereum went away. Lots of people would be sad if Reddit went away. But there's it right now, the way the markets look, Ethereum is worth about 10 times what what Reddit is valued at. Is that accurate? Yeah, just about. Doesn't matter. If we're okay. playing Calpol, then, then yeah, about three times. Cool. That's interesting. Anyway, uh, let's move on. What else is Ethereum good for? Verifiable ownership. So this is, we already touched on this a little bit. That's like something you can do with blockchains. Um, other places this comes up is with uh, crypto collectibles, like CryptoKitties. Um, how many of, how many people here remember CryptoKitties.com? Dot co, sorry. You can you can buy virtual cats, and the fact that you own this virtual cat is actually like stored on the blockchain. So again, you don't have to take the CryptoKitties.co word for it. You can go verify that you own, and obviously it won't look like a cat. It won't have the picture of your little crypto collectible. It's just going to be a little string that represents your cat's DNA, um, which is which is cool. Um, and then that lets you sell your crypto kitties on exchanges like OpenSea.com? OpenSea.what? Or? Try, try, try OpenSea, uh, just Googling it, because I don't remember. I think it might be IO. Yep. Yeah. .io. So OpenSea.io, you can, uh, if you sign in here with your Ethereum wallet. You can sell your crypto kitties or, or swap your crypto kitty for an egg crypto or for a Tom Mindaya or whatever these things are. I don't know. I don't play this stuff, but uh, some people do and some people are into this. Um, but maybe what's the most kind of like killer feature of 
Well, actually, certifiable, I, I have two more things on here, sorry. Um, and then we'll get into, the last one is the like biggest use case. So that's what I thought, where I thought I was going next. But certifiable fairness, um, this comes in where like, especially with uh, gaming websites or gambling websites, which are like murky regulatory area in the US for sure, but in other countries where such things are, are more allowed, um, there's still the problem of like, you have to trust this web entity, whatever it is, poker.com or whatever, to uh, run a fair game, that they're not cheating you. Um, and you just have to take their word for it. With uh, blockchain backing it, you can actually inspect their code. Anyone can go in and like see what they've deployed. And, and it's like bringing kind of that open source ethos to uh, any kind of web entity that needs it. So that's also useful in these kinds of gaming applications, slightly different kind of gaming, but these go together in a lot of different gaming type uh, applications right now. The biggest use case of Ethereum probably is programmable money. People call it DeFi. Um, if you're, if you see if you see articles about this online, it will probably use the word DeFi, uh, which stands for decentralized finance. I like the term open finance more. Um, and again, it has those properties of like, you can see what's in the smart contract and, and um, you can like verify that someone's not going to rip you off, that kind of thing. But you can also program your own um, like financial products. That's that's what's been like exploding in the last couple of years on Ethereum and, and has the biggest kind of market share by far right now is lending platforms and uh, like trading platforms. Um, I could bring up some of these. Do you know a good kind of basic order book exchange, Peter? Uh, oh shoot, my brain just turned. I just cool. Google it if one shows up. Yeah, just just look up uh, Dex D E X. Um, yeah, and it'll uh, probably be like one of the first ones. Finance. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah, that's actually Binance. not right on Ethereum, but Binance is a distributed exchange, so that that would be order books, right? Uh, this is not Binance though, but we'll search for Binance. Yeah. So if you want to trade one cryptocurrency for another, you can go on here and say like, I want to buy, um, I want to buy this much ETH with this much Bitcoin. Um, or like, I want to buy ETH at this price. I, I want to spend this much Bitcoin on it and someone else can come in and they can, and like these entire things can be orchestrated with smart contracts. Um, it takes a lot of, smart contract calls in order to do that. And at the like kind of slow uh, speed and the expensive exchange rate of Ethereum or the expensive transaction fees of Ethereum that becomes impractical. So people have found new kinds of uh, ways to do that. Uni Uniswap is probably the most um, like famous of these, which is called an automated market maker. So instead of matching one buyer to one seller, or like a few buyers to one seller kind of thing. Um, a bunch of people put in an asset and then the price is automatically calculated based on uh, how much of like these asset pairs are on Uniswap. Um, there are better talks to find out about this stuff. I understand it all in a very murky way, but this, this like DeFi open finance space um, has really like, it's just new, mind bending stuff is happening all the time right now, uh, all backed by Ethereum. So super interesting if you're into this kind of thing. Um, I, I like, under, yeah, like I said, I get it this much. There's, there's so much to it. Um, Peter, do you have anything else that you want to add about DeFi before we move on? Uh, yeah, there's the concept of a stable coin, which is pretty current. Cool. Stable coin. Yeah, so if you look up DAI or USDC, so Coinbase actually created a stable US dollar that's backed by cryptography. Instead. Whoa, that's not them. Yeah, <laughs> it's MakerDAO. <laughs> Maker, will, Maker will talk about DAI. Yeah. <laughs> so um, 
This one is really cool because it answers the question of like, well, can I buy a cheeseburger with it? It was just like one of those like arguments against cryptocurrency. Um, you know, like, I don't know if you guys know this, but in the 70s, like the United States dollar no longer was backed by gold. It was backed by, um, there's, uh, there's a quote. It's like, you can think of it as being backed by the entire goods and services of the United States, which is code for debt. Um, so it's like a debt backed dollar. <laughs> And uh, the idea of like USDC is it does, USDC and DAI both have different ideas, but it creates a market for the dollar to become a stable thing. So, so it's, it's really the way it works is like a bunch of people betting on the value of the dollar. And because so many people are betting on it and so many people are speculating that the US dollar is gonna stay up, like the value of a dollar is $1 today, right? Um, how accurate that is causes it to actually stay at a dollar. I, I know it's kind of mind bending, but um, the point is that imagine if the United States collapsed and this is like a horrible like doomsday scenario, the truth would be that like DAI or USDC would be more valuable than U the US dollar because there's, there's this market behind the value rather than the idea that there's a GDP or debt behind the value. Um, and that's really interesting is because Right now, it makes sense to create a stable coin that pinned to a currency well, of a country. But, and that's how USDC works, correct? Yeah, exactly. It's 100% pinned to the United States dollar. Same with that. I mean, both of them are, are pinned to the United States dollar. But the way that this one works, if I'm not wrong, is that there's a company that has a whole bunch of money in a bank account. And they're saying, like, when you buy five of this currency, we are reserving five of the US dollars in that bank account for you you could trade them back for those dollars. Is that accurate? I'm actually not sure about USDC. Um, yeah, That's USDT, I guess. Uh, but like the, the idea is, um, the, the idea of either of these though, like, what, like I said, they have different methods of them is when you have, a, yeah, Tether is I think the one that's actually like Tether money. Like you have money set aside that's like, when you mint it and a whole bunch of there's a bunch of these now because like uh what's the there's like a big like bank that launched their own i forget which one but yeah they have their own you know they have billions of dollars in a bank account already so they're like hey we may as well like tether a our own cryptocurrency and and right. tell you yeah and so that's that's all that's behind these ones yeah. Dai is um, it, it's that much more interesting kind of like marketplace market that the, the creates I, a stable currency. The, the point I'm trying to make here, though, is like not the mechanisms for how they do the stable currency is that they basically it's the first time in the world that you've had a currency that is meant for trading assets um, rather than storing value. You don't want to just buy a bunch of Dai and sit on it because it will never go up by definition. It will, it will stay at a constant value. Um, and the craziest thing to think about is like gold has, um, uh, there, there's a really good quote, gold is a, a, a great store of value for whatever reason, right? We perceive gold to be valuable. Um, the weight of gold to buy a luxury suit, the amount of gold that you would have to spend or convert to a currency to buy a suit has stayed the same for the last like, 250 years. Um, I never fact checked that, but it's an interesting idea, right? The idea that like gold is not really a good um, way of trading money, but like it's a good peg of value. Um, same with like any investments, a store of value. Whereas here you have an algorithm that says, this is good for trading. This is a tool to barter. This is what you should use to buy a cheeseburger in the future. Um, not that you'd literally just buy a cheeseburger with dye. Like right now, the things you can buy with dye are all digital assets. Like it's used for finance. It's used for like people do buy and sell things like um, online. I bought a cup of coffee with dye, but it was mainly for fun. I bought a hat with dye, right? Like like um, not not this hat, but a, a hat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, the point though, is it's really interesting because you have this divergence on like a century scale of like value store versus bartering. And like, we haven't really thought of that in our day to day lives. Now, cryptocurrency is like thinking of it, kind of forcing us to think about it. So I'll start off. Yeah, I guess. So you're to, to kind of like summarize that. Uh, something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, where it's this very volatile price, but a lot of people find those like adequate as a um, store of value, 
like just buy some, sit on it, long term it goes up, right? That's that chart that I showed at the beginning. Um, but you wouldn't want to buy it with the intent of spending it on some collectibles or spending it on a cheeseburger or just day-to-day -day transactions. So it's not a good medium of exchange. Those are two parts of money, store value, medium of exchange. Um, and for medium of exchange, you can use something like DAI. So it's almost like you would want to diversify your portfolio where you have your, you know, you have your like low interest checkings, checking account. That's something like DAI. And you know that that's not going to go away. And then putting money, other money in Bitcoin or a more uh, like volatile asset is a good long term play. Um, so, so I'm not telling you to go put your uh, life savings in, in any of these, but like, that's almost that's almost a way to conceptualize that, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly. Is that accurate? That it's like long term investment, use go ahead and use something or not investment, but like as a store of value long term, use something that's volatile. It's a good yeah, it's like it's like this is like you're just gonna use it for transactions. You're not gonna use it for um you know, just sitting on it for a long time. Right. What right. Which is what the initial value proposition of Bitcoin was, is you should use it to spend stuff. You should use it to spend on things. You should use it as a currency, but it's being used as a store of value. It's being used like a same account. Yep. So if you want to learn more about DeFi, we can we can put some resources in there. There's like Relay Node, the Relay Node network. They have different um, newsletters for different areas. So there's like the... the uh, New York City relay node, and this it's just a Substack uh, newsletter, but it has um, like tons of what's happening in DeFi. Um, it's a pretty long summary each week, and then there are a bunch of podcasts um, just about crypto in general, like uh, Epicenter podcast is probably one of the most popular, and it has. Um, Oh, they have a YouTube channel, but they, they have other ways to watch it too. Um, and they have a lot of their episodes end up being about um, DeFi right now, just because that's one of the most popular use cases. So anyway, let's move on. Uh, what are next gen blockchains good for? Um, so identity and money as new network primitives, this is almost true with Ethereum, but I think it's becoming more true with some of these next generation blockchains. Um, Anyone who has built a, a full like full app, front end and back end, knows that uh, signing in is a giant pain, right? Like this surprised me whenever I built my first app. It felt like uh, the framework I was learning, Ruby on Rails, was really good at um, handling a lot of stuff for me, at handling a lot of the like database stuff for me, but signing in a user and like storing their uh, like encrypted password in a safe way and those kinds of things. It felt like a lot of trust was being put on me. Like I didn't know that uh, it was so easy to get that stuff wrong and that like every single website I use could store passwords in plain text and I would never know. Um, and and just like building, building sign in solutions into every single website feels it's, it's so cumbersome. And I'm really excited for this uh, future where like, and that, that identity, that sign in authentication, like verifying that you are you becomes a primitive of the protocol, a primitive of the network, the same way that like TCP is a protocol right now, right? Like you carry your identity with you. Um, rather than it needing to be like respun by every new website that you use. That's going to be a huge game changer long term. Um, and same thing with money, right? Like building websites that um, like receive money or, or just a, even a simple like Salesforce type thing. Um, it's not, it's not, Salesforce is okay, but like I also know a lot of people who sell stuff who are like, frustrated by the limitations of Salesforce and building those kinds of systems is very complicated. And I think once money is built into the network, um, 
it's going to be way easier to build those kinds of things. So I think like DeFi is one interesting aspect of that that I certainly would not have thought of myself. But I'm excited for just like making it way easier for any developer to build. It'll be like the ease of building a front end app. It'll be kind of like a front end only app. I picture that it, I picture it being almost as easy as that to build um, like websites that do interesting things with money. Um, playable games uh, is another thing next gen blockchains are good for. This is um, right now that there's like those games that are all like trading these assets, uh, trading digital goods or that have the like certifiable fairness, but they're not made for like kind of fast paced games. And whenever you have a much more scalable uh, blockchain and a um, like much more scalable, lower transaction fees, right? And, and like the transactions happen faster that opens up more possibilities for what kinds of games can use the uh, like auditable and verifiably fair and uh, like all those nice properties of blockchains will be accessible to all new categories of games. Um, fast smart bots. So you could have a tip bot. Peter, do you want to talk about kind of some, some yeah. like cool ideas you have around this? Sure. Yeah. Well, so on the playable games, just uh, for a frame of reference, CryptoKitties, they maxed out uh, at 10,000 um, basically individual users trying to buy CryptoKitties and they halted the Ethereum network. 10,000. And if you look at like uh, Warzone, I think they're at 3 million users. So uh, that's like a ridiculous, like three, what is that, 300 times the scale? And the transactions that are happening in Warzone on their servers are like, you know, multiple, like on the millisecond level and transactions just on the, on Ethereum, on, on old blockchains, even though they're like new and just the first gen blockchains, uh, they are on the second scale, right? You send a transaction to the second, which is why finance works really well. Cause like, you know, an ACH transfer, it still beats that. It takes like three days for an ACH transfer. Ethereum. Yeah, well, each block in Ethereum is 15 seconds, and you there need you to wait several blocks to be confident that, like, it's it's legit. So right. it takes, uh, like, say a minute or two right. minutes on Ethereum to, like, know that this transaction went through and right. is there. Yeah, um, so, so for games, that's really hard if you want it on the blockchain. And they had a game called Cheese Wizards. The creators of CryptoKitties created Cheese Wizards. You can look up videos of the gameplay there. It's basically rock, paper, scissors but really, really slow and expensive rock, paper, scissors. Um, <laughs> uh, the fast smart bots idea is I think pretty cool because um, like bots are everywhere now. Like we, we, all of our CI runs on bots. We don't even call them bots anymore. There was like the chat bots in a while, Slack runs on bots, all of these bots. One cool thing is you can have autonomous bots that like have rules. So the idea of a tip bot here would be say you have like a, like a community and then you can say, I want to tip this person, but you're actually not paying out of your own pocket. You're paying out of the tip bot's pocket. And then the tip bot gets paid by like people tipping the tip bot when it does a good job. I know that's kind of mind boggling, but it's like a completely autonomous, completely. Or the company could pay the tip bot and then you could set up rules where like right. it, it requires four people to say tip that bot, tip Peter. Right. before Peter actually gets a tip. This is where you get into the actual unique value of like a blockchain is, yeah, exactly. Like a bunch of people could just send uh, transactions to the specific account and the account knows what to do with those transactions. And that's like the reason why that's doable on Ethereum but not feasible on Ethereum is just because of the speed and the cost. If you wanted to send a tip, you'd have to pay the transaction cost, which right now I think is like 0 0.019 ETH, which is a lot of money, um, right? Like. It, 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 at Ethereum being like two hundred dollars, you're talking about like ten bucks to send the transaction. You're like paying ten dollars to spend a dollar, right? Rather than what it should be like a fifth of a penny, and it happens in at maximum one one second, which is a block time on a new blockchain is one second per block, um, right? And so that, that means to to finality, it takes yeah. three or four blocks, say five blocks. So it's five seconds is like a bad turnaround time on a new blockchain, yeah. which is like still slow i want to call that out right like you would want to uh, on your front end for 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 many kinds of applications five seconds is still not tolerable 
Um, but it's like you can you can do tricks on a front end to wait five seconds, and the user won't even notice most of the time. Right. Um, but yeah. you can be reasonably certain for like you'd only really need to guarantee a few blocks have passed for financial applications. For pretty much everything else, you can say when the block is like actually when the transaction is signed, which is faster than the block being produced. So um, like anyways, we're getting into the nitty gritty. The point is that like but it would be like one second turnaround time is what right. you're saying. And okay. also you can be more like optimistic with how you show it to the user instead of waiting like a financial app. You would definitely want to wait for finality. But yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, I want to keep moving through these because we're I'm taking longer than I think was the goal, but um, easier programmable money. So this goes into money as a new network primitive. Uh, some things, some like ideas for apps that I have that I want to see is almost like a replacement for Patreon. That's just sort of like individual uh, like guilds or networks of artists. So the example that I think of is like. Um, I read dinosaur comics at quants.com a fair bit. And Ryan North, that webcomic artist, is super active in the like webcomic uh, like scene. And he often does these like collaborations with other webcomic artists. And they're all on Patreon. And I can go support Ryan North on his individual Patreon page and give him $5 per month or whatever. But I think it would be pretty cool. And I think he might be into it. And maybe a bunch of other webcomic artists he knows would be into it. If instead I could like pay him and 20% uh, of the money goes to his guild, right? And then like their guild can set up their own rules. It's programmable money. So they could say like, okay, that 20% goes into a shared like guild mm -hmm. pot. And then everyone, maybe different uh, artists in the guild have like some people have a one uh, a one x vote and other people have a two x vote or something like that. They can set it up like that. But then like artists in their guild could say, "Hey, I want to use the guild pot of money to do this cool project," and the artists within the guild could like vote on whether they want that to happen. And setting up those kinds of like governance systems. Um, is going to become a whole lot easier whenever identity and money are new network primitives. Um, another idea that I love is restaurant co-ops. Everyone started setting up sites where you could uh, send, like, you could buy gift cards to individual restaurants when COVID-19 happened to, like, help keep individual restaurants afloat. And I wanted to see something that was much more, actually, I think... Uh, like the, the people at Commons Food Hub here in Lancaster did a great job with this. Where like, since you can't go to all of these restaurants, since you can't go to market and like just browse, um, there was an awesome website set up called Commons Food Hub. And you can order and get like a bunch of food from different vendors every Wednesday or Saturday. That's cool. Something that I, I think would also be possible is something closer to that thing that I described with artist guilds, where like a cooperative of restaurants in a city or in the neighborhood of a city could all uh, like offer something like a new product that they haven't offered before. Say it's a meal plan. I spend a hundred dollars, three hundred dollars a month or something like that. I don't know what the price point is to make this make sense. But say I spend three hundred dollars a month and that lets me go to any participating restaurant and eat. Uh, just by like showing that I have verifying that I've like purchased this meal plan. Um, so I pay ahead of time. The restaurants will get like a guarantee that they have this money. Um, they have a say in how that money is distributed. It probably doesn't get evenly split between all of them. It probably goes to like where I actually eat. Um, but even if I don't eat there, they're all still getting paid. And that's, I, I love that because um I, as uh, like someone who managed to keep my job through the entire lockdown, um, I want to I want to see the entire restaurant scene stay afloat, right? Like, I think it would be really sad if like the places I think to go to when I'm stuck at home um, do okay, but a bunch of other small places that I like only stop in whenever I'm out walking around uh, all disappear during this time. That would be that would be sad. So it gives, but it gives restaurants the ability to do this kind of stuff themselves. 
Um, and if they if they do that and they kind of pool their resources in that way, um, it would also give them the ability to like run their own food delivery programs, right? Like the co-op of restaurants can employ uh, like couriers instead of getting price gouged by uh, Uber Eats or whatever the other, right? Like these Grubhub, um, I know some of these like current solutions for delivery do not treat the restaurants in them very well at all. Um, and it's going to make it a lot easier to build for like restaurants to, um, for new platforms to offer restaurants an alternative that like gives them a lot more control over the, the exact way that these things are shaped. Um, moving on. Uh, open uh, six minute warning. Ahead. It's, it's, it's about uh, six till 5 p.m. Just when, it, or oh, sorry, 5 p.m. my time. So, 8 p.m. Yeah. Yeah, you're 8 p.m. There you go. Um, cool. So, let's fly through them. Open state composable apps. This is like a, a dream that a lot of people have that I think we're going to start seeing explored and see the first versions of this uh, created over the next couple of years. Um, but the idea is that instead of data belonging to one app like Facebook, um, the data belongs to the internet, right? And and any app can use that data. It's almost the way that like you can use a bunch of different email clients to look at the same email. Um, this is going to be that, but for like a whole rich uh, like network of data. So your your uh, your reputation from Reddit will follow you to other websites that you use or your reputation from being an Uber driver or an Airbnb guest or whatever it is, right? Like that kind of thing will follow you. Your network of friends, the data that you've created in one app will could be visible from another app. Um, different kinds of apps could give you, you different ways to filter the the like news feed that you're seeing. So you might want to use a different app that um, displays it in a different way or hides whole categories of content or something like that. Um, super fun to think about what's possible there. Uh, but definite questions around actual architecture. Like, how will this actually work? I, I want to I wanna see people explore that more. Um, New digital commons. So I have one idea that I'm calling infinite internationalization. Uh, Peter and I like had a talk where we where we discussed this idea that I can link to. Um, but thinking about Wikipedia as like a commons rather than a company makes so much sense to me. So like Wikipedia's data is could be like a public good that is backed by the network, not by a specific company's servers. Um, and tipping Wikipedia could go through smart contracts so that it's like verifiable out in the open and a lot easier to see like what where the where the needs are right like um how close is wikipedia to actually running out of funding those kinds of things it, it would be trackable on like a public stats page that's automatically up to date instead of us just trusting the the like once a year campaign for donations um so those are just some ideas. And then I think there's there's a lot more that we haven't thought of yet, right? Like this is what's, it's kind of like where I feel like we're maybe at like 1992 for the World Wide Web um, or, or maybe even earlier than that. Maybe we're before the web was born, right? In the late eighties, if we're gonna go with the metaphor of like internet to kind of this new version of the internet. Um, but there, there's a lot of potential here and a lot of cool stuff that you could do. But these are some ways to start thinking about what's possible and what kinds of things you could build. So if you want to learn more, um, oh, actually, real quick, when not to use blockchains. Avoiding fiat currencies. Um, maybe you could do this. It's not appealing to me to just like live as a drug de live like a drug dealer all the time, right? Like there are reasons to participate in your actual uh, economy, your your local uh, economy. Um, replacing slash avoiding regulations. People, you know, I we listed birth certificates, death certificates, bank transactions as as ledgers. Um, 
And some people are like, we can replace the IRS with regulations and or with with blockchains. I'm like, maybe a hundred years down the road, we'll like figure out what this looks like. But in the near term, that's yeah, really complicated. I, we don't have time to get into that more, but um, a fun conversation for sure. Um, private info: if you want to store like medical records on the blockchain, you can encrypt them. You can encrypt the data and store it in these like decentralized protocols and like track it via a blockchain. Um, but all cryptography is broken on an infinite timeline, right? Like SHA-256 is the current like gold standard for encryption, but 10 years down the road, it will likely be broken and someone could decrypt all of your medical records. Like, 10 years from now, someone could decrypt all of your current medical records. Um, so probably not a great idea. Um, replacing your server and or your relational database. This was the biggest thing that I told people during the last hype cycle in late 2017 was like, good news, you don't need a blockchain. You just need a database. You can, you can get started now. It's much easier than you thought. Just like you need a web app. You don't need a blockchain. Um, and I think that they're going to continue to exist, right? Like these, these things solve different problems so we will still need the tools that we know from like web 2 um, even when decentralized protocols and blockchains are much more common all right so learn more on uh, near's youtube is great not just for learning about near but there's like a whole um blockchain on-ramp series which is fantastic I highly recommend um i actually haven't gotten super far in that but i love it um, near.org community, if you want to start pitching in and uh, earning some near tokens um, for actually, I don't even know if that's a if that's a full thing yet, but that's what's coming. Um, but yeah, lots of ways to get involved in near specifically. And then if you want to learn more about Ethereum, Ethereum.org. Um, and these are some other Cosmos and Polkadot are other like next gen blockchains. So if you want to find out what else is happening in the blockchain ecosystem today, Cosmos and Polkadot are some interesting ones to check out. Um, and then CryptoZombies.io is a great way to learn how to write Ethereum smart contracts. And it has you build your own like uh, CryptoKitties clone called CryptoZombies. Yeah, that is the talk. This is the last slide. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see people again, um, but I can reshare to field questions if that would be useful. Yeah, in what, I have a que one question I have is I hear about, uh, maybe these are dead now, but IBM talking about starting to run their own blockchain, uh, Kodak mm. running their own blockchain. Uh, you know, in what way, like, where's the distribution? What does this just like complete nonsense? I mean, nonsense from Kodak wouldn't be a shock, but <laughs> IBM is a little more surprising. Um, yeah, so I think the, the general category of thing you're talking about is like a permissioned blockchain, where like, they're using a blockchain to, the, the idea would be that there's like these internal, um, internal processes to the company, or to a specific company, or maybe a small set of companies, that uh, it's easier to use, like a, a blockchain is good fit for that need. Um, I'm not sure that I buy it. Like to me, it feels a little bit like you could probably use a database for that, but I'm, I haven't looked into, like, I don't know all of the use cases that they're proposing for these or that they envision using these kind of permissioned blockchains for. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm reserving judgment somewhat, but my initial take is like, eh. Yeah, I have a, I have a stronger opinion, which is like, I think they're BS, um, mainly because like, well, if you look at that list of things we said, like, don't use the blockchain for, a lot of the time IBM is, like, selling specifically, uh, like, any permission blockchain, they're selling to, like, big companies. And in my mind, they're actually selling on a market inefficiency, which is that, like, enterprise companies are used to enterprise sales, where you go to the biggest and oldest institution that's guaranteed, that uh, tells you this is secure, 
and we have like years of experience to prove that it's secure and that, and like this is why you should go with enterprise like that's how enterprise sales works and so um the problem is that they're they're essentially creating private networks and uh if you want to use a blockchain well like now what you've just done is you've created a really complicated expensive to run database rather than just like if you want a private thing like Chad said, you can just use a server in a database. Like pretty much across the board, if you want it to be a private thing, you can you can write a token that goes and talks to a server, and then it'll say like, okay, like Joshua Boyd has like ten of these centralized Corgi tokens, and then I'm going to transfer them in the server to Chad. It's a SQL database, right? Or James, right? James gets some of the tokens. If you want that, just do it. If you want supply chain, just build a server. If it's run by IBM, it's completely centralized. They have full access to the entire blockchain. They can lie and say that it's verified. They can they can do whatever they want. They can they can do the same things that you can do with the server. To me, it doesn't make a lot of sense why you would want that. And so for people who are buying it, what they want is the buzzword blockchain. They want the things they've heard blockchains are for, and then they're paying a company for the brand. <clears throat> so there is a few a few exceptions, but overall, I think a public blockchain makes sense for ninety nine percent of the use cases that a blockchain is going to be valuable for. Disclaimer: That's my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. So, um, actually, a uh, while back in the discussion, you actually mentioned Nacha and the ACH. So, way back when that was getting started, um, you know, it's going to be this electronic transfer. It's going to be massively save money, reduce costs, it's going to be awesome. So as soon as it was released and verified, the first thing that happened is every single institution added a charge to it. So you have a surcharge to send an electronic file, you have a surcharge to pull your money out of an electronic account, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a completely wonderful system that is completely bloated and cannibalized by the profiteering people that run companies, you know, if you didn't pro, if you weren't that type of profiteer, your company would probably be listed under a nonprofit organization. So, how do you blockchain develop and not become that? I mean, it just doesn't look like there's an option. Uh. So the, the, let me see if I can restate the like fear, if I can, <laughs> it's that um, while blockchains theoretically allow for much cheaper transactions in the same way that ACH did, um, by the time that a bunch of companies with a profit motive kind of like build end user um, offerings on top of this blockchain, they're going to like maybe the cost savings to the end the end user the end consumer are going to be slightly lower than the old system but like there's going to be a lot of just uh like a lot scooped off by all of the companies doing this um i think it's a valid concern um and and like I'm not utopian about like blockchain is going to solve all the problems, right? Like I think, I think blockchain is going to, um, I, I think it could change the world in the same way that like the web changed the world, uh, which since th for the last four years has not seemed like, you know, no one thinks that it's all good anymore. Um, it's like, there's good, there's bad, it's a, it's a mix. It certainly changed the world a lot. It didn't just flat out improve the world. Um, where I would say like that particular concern doesn't worry me is that um, ACH from my under, like I don't understand ACH very well, but it's only these giant banking institutions that are using this protocol. Um, blockchain kind of like, opens the floodgates for any developer to build on it. So it's not just gonna be like giant banking institutions with a profit motive. 
it is also going to be the like smaller nonprofit and open source projects and indie developer and like all of these different people who are going to build on top of it. And so I think there's going to be much like if the competition is in the fees that are offered, um, then then I think like there's going to be much fiercer competition and much smaller um, margins in that market. And which that makes I sense. Want, cool. I want to make a little note here too, which is kind of an interesting thing is um, capitalism is like the most formidable <laughs> like uh, pattern that we've ever seen, right? Like it, it's not good or bad. It's it's formidable. It's extremely powerful. It's scary in some ways, but it's like, yeah, for, formidable is the word I would use for it. Um, what it's led to is the concept of a corporation, which is this very strange thing. It's like a group of people, but it's not the people. It's not a human. It's, 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 if you fire everybody inside of a corporation, replace them with other people, but keep what it does, it still exists. What is this? It's like a zombie, right? That is motivated by profit. It's, it's goal is to like, you know, sell a product and then capture revenues from the product. Well, people have different needs, right? Like I personally have worked as a contractor in the past and I was like operating as a corporation and a person at the same time, which meant that my revenues as a company was my income, like how I spent money on my che my cheeseburgers, to go back to cheeseburgers, right? Uh, I guess I'm hungry. <laughs> um, so uh, individuals, because they have different needs, uh, like if you're a programmer who builds something that's really valuable to a lot of people and all you really want is like to have let's just say a six-figure income you want to make a hundred thousand dollars exactly every year and you figure out a way to meet your needs and you're not like greedy so you're just going to set it that way you, you you publish this api and it automatically makes you that money without you needing to do anything except for maintenance right like that is a world it's actually hard to find a niche like that you like like right now like there's books about it for our work week talks about it like um, you know, there, there's like people sell courses on how to do this. Um, but like, this is a benefit of, and like, they're the only ones managing to do it. Yeah. Right. They're the only ones managing to do it. Right. Like, um, this is one of those things where like, if you have all of the infrastructure already built for you and you build a, a useful program where the fees are then captured automatically, like your job for like four years might be building a bunch of these programs and each of them only take a really small fee. And then at the end of four years, you've got a bunch of property that you build like intellectual property that you don't have to manage like a company you can just manage the addresses you can manage it like um however you want to manage it but the point is that like that wouldn't really be profitable for a corporation it is very profitable for an indie developer and and like because i said right like a, a profitable company is very different than me peter who wants to buy a cheeseburger and like wants to pay my rent so um, that sharding, that fragmentation, I think is something we'll see. I think it's really likely people will publish libraries that are then immediately public and then fees are captured automatically. You want to use them and they're valuable, you're paying the developer. You're not paying a company. So, And it's not a don donation. It's actually like service rendered, you get paid. So I think it's a good model. I, okay, to cool. that, I mean, I was just curious about that. So. Those yeah, are good uh, presentations. Thank it's you. A fair, it's a fair concern. I mean, there's the argument also that you could basically trick users into like interacting with a contract where the fees are greater than the product that they're buying. But that's a whole other thing. There's always going to be assholes trying to that are, are like doing that kind of stuff. I think. Uh, one other thing that that just made me want to like riff on quickly is the idea of like digital commons. So this is um, this is an idea that I've seen where it's like almost I've I've heard people use this term open enterprise and the idea is almost like a blend of like what corporations do well and what open source projects do well and by moving some of the governance of that entity to uh, like these blockchain based voting systems and whatnot. Um, Maybe it doesn't just need to be indie developers, but it can almost be um, like the Wikipedia example is really interesting to think about. Like Wikipedia could exist without the entity of like Wikimedia LLC or whatever it is, right? Like the the uh, utility, the the like website that you go to to get all of this information doesn't need to be doesn't need to be housed on like one company's servers. Um, and managed by them. It can be like shared by this entire 
these these new networks that are starting so like ipfs could be where the data is stored and like the uh near or polka dot or cosmos or ethereum 2.0 could be how like people pay um to to like help keep this thing alive um and pay for like ongoing maintenance of it so it's kind of like indie developer but but more like a whole team where it's like kind of it's this open source thing but it has a much better funding model so um in this discussion we've gone a couple of times back to bartering and um uh i actually grew up with kind of a half and half uh system so grew up in uh you know the united states born and raised multi-generation all of that but have tons of family everywhere else and i grew up in a farming community so while you know you'd go to the store for some things almost everything else was literally bartered traded um, you know, that kind of stuff still drives me nuts that I buy eggs at a grocery store and, and just all sorts of weird stuff. But um, uh, a lot of that system, though, um, as you guys mentioned when you were talking about the DIA, require kind of a um, an agreed upon value. Like, you know, me helping you three hours on your roof is worth, you know, whatever your, you know, a uh, quarter of a your year goat. of eggs. Yeah, whatever it is. Um, so how do you think that um, going outside of having the um, peg to the dollar type thing, how do you think that is actually a, a good model for doing the funding and the value descriptions the way at least the way they're described um like in the discussion on dia and a couple of other um well early early bitcoin actually um i mean how do how do you think that kind of model is going to work going forward as far as uh kind of leveling what value is for bartering between developers and those kind of tools um i don't know i don't know that i see like i think where we mentioned bartering might have been with those like crypto collectibles right like i'll give you i'll give you uh um i'll give you a, this crypto kitty for this god sure. of war or mm -hmm. whatever um and that's like a very specific that's like these collectible tokens but i think for the uh fungible currencies right mm -hmm. where like it's so, like die which DAI people, I've, I've always heard it pronounced die, by the way, like you're rolling a die. Um, but I, I think so like die as a medium of exchange, I think of it much more like cash or like dollars, right? Like I think people will, as long as, and I would also imagine that like within specific locations, like the United States or Canada or Europe, like people will want to know how much people will want a price in their local currency that they're mostly using. If however many decades down the road, we get to a point where like fiat currencies are much less used and like the default is a few different cryptocurrencies, um, I would expect that prices will still be listed in a similar way, but it'll be like Bitcoin will be the primary or it won't be Bitcoin, but it'll be like, you know, DAI won't be pegged to the dollar. DAI will be pegged to, I don't know, something else. I have no idea gotcha. what it would be gotcha. pegged to in this kind of, in this kind of scenario. The dollar gotcha. is pegged to oil and DAI is pegged to the dollar. And I don't know. Um, gotcha. I was well, just yeah, maybe of, it's a just curious listed concept. In ETH, so right, like maybe it's just listed in ether or or in uh, like near tokens or whatever it is. Um, maybe they become more stable over time, and and as different kinds of like stabilizing mechanisms are built into them, um, and the volatility goes away, so people can use it more like those raw currencies instead of the stable coins as their medium of exchange. That's my thought, but uh, I don't know. Peter, did you want to add anything? Or I think uh, it's so hard to speculate about that stuff. It's funny, though, because I grew up um, in a rural part of 
California, I grew up with eggs. We had chickens, and I, I didn't buy eggs until I got to college, and I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> Four dollars for a box of eggs. These are free. <laughs> Side note. So I think yeah, the bartering thing is really cool. I think like um, what I would like to see is like communities building their own versions of these, like organizations. Like yeah, like you know, I I am very skeptical of the put everything on the blockchain like mindset, and and so I'm always like hedge my my uh, statements with that. But like co-ops are a great example. Chad and I talked a lot about co-ops because they would fit onto this model really, really well. A thing where they have their own government, they have their own rules, the people who are a part of it agree on it. They they have a unified like reason for doing it. A community could have that too, right? Like the one thing that's like, here, here's a little side anecdote um, is Venmo has ruined uh, meals with friends for me. Because I used to have this mentality of like, well, I'll buy you a sandwich, you buy me a sandwich, like no big deal. We forget who bought who a sandwich because we've been friends for so long. It's like that's part of the deal, right? You're investing in the friendship, so to speak. And now it's like, you know, if you go to a meal with more than three people, it's like, hey, do you have your Venmo? I'm like, I'll get, I'll get it. Like, why do we have to turn like a meal with friends into this weird financial transaction? I think it's kind of, I think that kind of sucks. But it's the way the world is moving, right? You know, that's of like being able to turn everything into an asset. Anything could be put on the market, right? Like, say you have eggs in your like community, and your community now is like, well, we know exactly the we we know exactly about one egg in this community, right? Like, James has eggs. They're like, and if he tries to give you one for eighty cents, he's an asshole. It's like, well, you know, that's kind of sucks. Um, you know, so so it's not good for everything, and hopefully, it won't uh, spread everything. Well, I really, really appreciate you guys taking the time for those questions. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, good questions. It's fun. It's like, I think I can speak for Chad too. Like we love this stuff. Like we think about it all day, every day. So. Yes. Any other questions, or we should, should we wrap up? We're a little over time, I think. Yeah, I mean, in person, we would like go to the bar now and <laughs> keep talking about it all with with food right. and or drinks. Um, so it would keep going on, but I think we're, we're at the 80 minute mark for a YouTube video and that's, that's a lot. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thanks Thank a lot. Very interesting. And Peter. Oh, well, wait, sorry. Jo Joshua Huber said something and it got cut off. What was that? No, just saying it was very interesting. Thanks for putting oh, it good. on. Right, you enjoyed it. Cool. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for participating. Yeah, thank you. Good, good work, Chad, by the way. Shout out to Chad for the presentation. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. And um, yeah, keep an eye on techlancaster.com for what's coming next month. Cool. All right. All right. All right. I'm signing off. Bye, guys. Bye,